Let's have a look what we're going to be learning uh, or paper two is going to consist of. But what I've done was here, yeah, I have put this uh, combination of what your section B with question, um, that would be your second paper. So in the second paper today, we're going to do settlement. And in the settlement, we're going to do different types of concepts. Now that is, and I want to point that out to all of you, great talk, is this concepts are extremely, extremely important. Spend a day or a couple of days and go and learn your concept because the concept, as you've been told in the exams, is now going to count two marks. And it is vitally important that you understand um, that you need to know these things. Right, then when we look at settlement, we can go and divide it into two main sections, namely rural and an urban settlement. Right, now what is the difference between the rural and urban settlement that we're going to go through? But what is important is there are certain things that is communal, if I can put it like that. Right, so when we look at our first definition, the site, right, so what is a site? And then also with our site comes our situation. Right, so when we look at that, there is, so when the site will develop, what kind of pattern is it going to have? And then eventually, what is the function that it's going to do? Then, obviously, as the years go on, certain issues will develop, and we're going to look at the issues, like, for instance, rural urban migration, um, depopulation of the rural areas, and then we can go to the urban areas. Now, the urban areas is a lot more um, intense, if we can put it like that. Um, and under the urban areas, we need to know uh, also things like, for instance, the site. And, and you will see when you go and look at your notes, there will be basically an overlap because remember, many, many moons ago, um, Cape Town didn't just stand or start as Cape Town. It started from somewhere. And that somewhere must have been a rural function. So that's why we're not showing it over here, and but we will, in your notes, you would have picked that up. Right, so then a little bit different. Now, this urban areas develop into land use zones, right? Um, so what do we use the different zones for? Um, if you look at the town, do that all look the same? However, is there a profile? Then we have street patterns, and then the same thing as in with your rural, eventually we find that all kinds of issues start to develop. Now the red, we're going to leave for tomorrow, and we're going to get back to that one. Right, so in front of you, you would have been given questions, right? So we choose uh, when we as geography teachers start asking questions, um, there's always some kind of format that we have. What is it? Right? What am I talking about? Okay. Uh, what is concept? What is what is settlement? What is it? Okay. Where will I find that settlement? Right. Um, do we have all settlements at the same place? No. Cape Town and Marmesbury or Easterfontein is not in the same location. Why are they not in the same location? There is a specific reason for it. Okay. Why is it there? Why is Cape Town here? Why is Easterfontein there? Why is Marmesbury? And you will see I'm using examples close to you so that you can relate to these places. Right, then we go to it, but what does it look like? Right? Cape Town doesn't look the same as Marmesbury. Marmesbury doesn't look the same as Easterfontein. Or oh, let's use Langemont. I think most of you are familiar with Langemont. Then uh, the development of Cape Town hasn't had any effect on the people um, and the environment. Yes. 
Um, and then our last one that we're going to look in our question is, but right, how can we manage it now? Currently, the whole uh, global warming is playing a very, very important role. Every time we open up the newspaper or you watch a news clip, you see that they are talking about the environment. Now, but what is very important that in term one or in paper one, you are doing climatology, geomorphology, and now we're doing settlement and economics. And indirectly, we can't separate the two because whatever we do in settlement and the economy, it will affect the climate. So we need to develop this sustainable uh, approach to or in harmony between the two of these um, concepts or two sections of geography. Right, so we're going to start off with what is a settlement, right? Um, and if you're going to look on your uh, key notes, you will see what is a settlement. Now, if anybody uh, can tell me quickly, right, what do you think is a settlement? Right. Now, this is a very, very big settlement. And in this very big settlement, you're going to find what makes a settlement? I always say, let's start with the obvious, right? We need people, right? So we have people, right? So where do these people have to stay? They have to stay in buildings. Where do, how do they get to work? Communication or roads, railway lines, uh, buses, and then obviously they need to do something. We just don't stay in buildings, so therefore they perform different activities. And very, very important is that they work as a single unified unit. Right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back quickly. Oops, sorry. Right. So I'm going to show you that picture there. And and I want you to write down quickly from what I've explained to you is what makes a settlement. Right, try and think what I've just said to you. And if the teachers in the class can just check is how easy it is to remember what is the function or what is a settlement. Okay, right. Okay, so let's go there quickly. Right, with Anthony, first of all, we have got people, right? We have got buildings, we've got communication network, we've got activities, and at the end of the day, we all work together as a unit. Right, so that is the function of a settlement. Now, do all these segments look exactly the same? No, right? We know that already. We don't have to go very far. So what are my two types of settlement that I'm having? Number one, a rural settlement and an urban settlement. So what makes a rural settlement different to an urban settlement? A rural settlement has got one function, a single function, and it will only perform once and now. Uh, the function that we will have over here is, um, in your notes, you will see it gives you the, in the single function, primary activities. So in your notes, in your daily notes, you can go and write down there, it includes fishing, farming, forestry, and mining. So those are the three, four components that will make up your, it's, a single function that will um, identify your rural settlement. When we go to our urban settlement, settlement, urban settlement is a multifunctional. So a multifunctional, you will see in your notes, there you will see it's a secondary function and tertiary functions. 
right underneath your secondary function, you can write down there, it is your manufacturing, 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 whereas in the tertiary, we will also get the service. Now, the one that's not on here is your quaternary, right? So it's a fourth one that is not on here is the quaternary. Right now, quaternary is a term that has come up quite recently, and that has to do with research. So um, the quaternary uh, function is the new research that everybody is doing, and especially now with COVID, we find that that has become a very, very important um, function in our society. Right, now, we've looked at the, what we're going to do now is we're going to function or we're going to focus on the rural area. Right, so what makes the rural area different to the urban area? Right, so let's have a look at the urban and the rural area. So first of all, let's look at the two types of patterns of rural areas. Number one, it is a nucleated rural area. Now look at that. There you see a town, right? There is a town, but that town is surrounded by green, right? And that green that you see over there is cultivated land or orchards and vineyards or even just normal felt. So that area over there is called a nucleated rural area. When we go to that one over there, you will see houses together, right? And few houses, and they are surrounded, and that is a dispersed um, rural settlement. Now, when you look at these two different types of um, settlements, you will see that each of them have got the advantages and it's got its disadvantages. So, at the, so that, therefore, you will see that staying in this particular area over here in terms of safety, um, it's a lot better, right? Um, disadvantages, you have to travel, so, then, so each of these two different types of settlements has got its advantages and its disadvantages. Right? So if you are a loner, you obviously would rather like to stay on a dispersed, but also very important, just remember that with dispersed settlement, there is also an isolated settlement. And I always say, how do I know the difference between an isolated and a dispersed settlement? And I always compare, if you take, for instance, the farm in the Peru, you've got this one farm in the middle of nowhere, and you've got to travel um, a couple of kilometers before you get to your neighbor. However, if you are farming in the Pearl area, it takes you maybe five, six, seven minutes and you're next to your neighbor. So there is a distinct difference that dispersed and isolated, you can present that answer if that kind of question is asked to you. Okay, right, so next thing we're gonna go on to is, when we look at these, um, these settlements. Right, now, you will see I have put something together here so that you can see how the order is. How do you, these things change in size? So first of all, we start off with an isolated farmstead. Right? So that is, if we go right back to settlement, is where did the settlement start from? It started from a farm, right? Irrespective of what type of farm it was, uh, it started as a farm, then it became a hamlet, then it became a village, and as the places become bigger, 
it changed its name and its function. So where do I now cut off? Where is a rural area or a rural settlement and where is a urban settlement? Now, if we look at it, here's the poly. So when we look at, I'm gonna put this together then. Right, so they put all of that together. Right, so which of these segments is, will be the smallest? Obviously, your farm, right? Now, when we have a look at your farm, when you look at your hamlet, you look at your village, you will see that their functions are unifunctional. They will only function in one thing. So they will either do agriculture, they will either do fishing, they either will be doing mining, so they will only all forestry and they will only be doing one function. However, when we look at the pyramid, it is this, if you go and look, most of the people in the world actually still stay on your farms. Now, as the village become bigger, it then changes its function. So a village then changes into a town a town then changes into a city, city changes into a metropolis, and a conurbation, and a megalopolis. Right now, when we look at the conurbation, do we have any conurbations in South Africa? Yes, we do. And the one that we have is the Pretoria Bitwater's Rank for Ianachum. Uh, conurbation. So Pretoria, Bitwater's Rank, for Enigham Conurbation. Do we have any marked megalopolis in South Africa? No, we don't. It's overseas and we don't have any of that in South Africa. Right, now we have looked at the bones of a settlement. We say we've identified, all right, what is a settlement? The shape, or how does it develop? Now we're going to go and we say, but why did it develop it? So when we're going to look at the why, we're going to look at the following two words. Number one is site and situation right now what i want you to do is i want you to write down what is the site site if you want to make it an everyday thing is where you stay right so where you stay that is your site what is your situation it is the area where you live in Right, now before we're going to go any further, I am going to ask Rosendahl. Right, is Rosendahl on there? Yeah. Rosendahl, would you be so kind looking at this illustration that I've got over here? Which of the, give me three. Give me three factors that will make that people will want to go and stay in that particular area. So we're going to look at um, site is the reason for why I want to stay there. Right. So. And if there's anybody else that want to contribute, you're welcome. Colleagues, you are reminded to use the WhatsApp line. Please feel free to post any of your questions via WhatsApp. Or alternatively, you can use the chat. Thank you. And I'll re repeat the question is, what factors will contribute towards the location of a place. So in other words, factors that will influence in the choice of the site. So when I want to go and build 
the first segment, a farm. Let's start right from the beginning. So what is my soil? It's the beginning of everything, it was a farm. So on this drawing over here, or diagram, what would have been my reason for starting a farm in this area over here? What do you think you would have chose? Any school, any school can answer. Anybody with a answer, please. What factors will influence the choice of a site? Type it in the chat box, send a voice note. Okay. Okay, all right. Maybe we'll be a little bit shy. Okay, so let's then have it. I'm going to start a farm. All right, so what am I going to need? First of all, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of farm I'm going to start. The first thing is I'm going to look for water. Okay, so there we go. Right, I've got water. Second thing that I need, I need to build a house. So there I've got my woodland, I've got a forest. Right, what I'm going to use my forest, it's actually twofold. I'm going to use the woodland, I'm going to use it for building material, and I'm going to use it for fuel. Right? Now, um, depending on what I'm going, so I can look, right, I've got a, um, I have got my river, so I've got water, but also next to the river, it is fairly flat. So I don't have to worry, I can just go and clear a piece of land and I can build my house over there. And so I don't have to walk very far to get my water. I don't have to take my cattle very far to get to the water. So those are all factors that contribute to the choice of site. Nine out of ten times you will see that uh, we're going to have that uh, in this area, which is close to the river, the grass will be good grass for grazing. And therefore, we will see that those are factors that will influence the site. Now, as this settlement or this single house becomes more and more, we see that we have to move from one place to another and we start developing a road, right? So these roads that we have, as you can see over here, have got different shapes. Some of them run there. There's a bridge over there. Some of these houses are very close. So we're starting to see all kinds of patterns starting to develop because of the expansion right now in front of you you have got these questions but you've also got this drawing in front of you right and i'm going to give you a few minutes and i want you to fill in these um i'm going to read the question to you and then you're going to fill it in on your um, on your answer sheet. Question number one, it says to you, what is the name given to the settlement? A, which is located away from the water because water is seen as a threat. Right, so there is A, A, A is over there. Right now, the clue that I'm going to give you, we are talking about here a dry point settlement or a wet point settlement. Right, so your answer is going to be either a dry point settlement or a wet point settlement. Right. Teachers, can you please 
Perhaps you see that the learners fold that in. Okay, right. Has everybody done that? Okay, right. So, um, let's have a look at, uh, we're going to come back to the to, to definition, a dry point settlement and a wet point settlement. We're going to come back to that one. Right. Let's go to B. B, they say to you, identify or name the settlement pattern at B. Right? Settlement pattern at B. Now, if we go back two or three slides, I showed you the two pictures. Right? The one picture was in the middle. It had the uh, all the houses surrounded by um, by Greenland, and the other one had um, had houses, individual houses, and then only so there was a big difference. So, what kind of settlement pattern is B? Right? Have we got that? Then we're going to number 4.1.3 C. All right. Now it says to you, why is this? Okay. Now that is a very good com a comparison because C and, and B, there is one little dot, here is a whole lot of dots. So what does a whole lot of dots indicate? They're all together. So the question there is, why is settlement C referred to as a nucleated settlement? So there are great talks. It is important how you looking at the picture itself actually will help you to identify your answer. Right, so if you get stuck in the exams and you think, oh, Mammal mimic, it's isolated, dispersed, nucleated. Right, so now, is this nucleated or is this nucleated? No, nucleated means a lot together. All right, so there I've worked it out. That one is a nucleated because there are many little houses or buildings, if we want to put it like that. That is because there are many buildings in that area there. Right, then we're going to go to number E, right? Now, number E is something that we said to you is the name of the settlement over there. Now, E and G, it is a little bit difficult because if you look at it, and this again, this comes in with your map work, right? Now look carefully over there. There, you see, is some kind of landfall, right? There, you also see there is some kind of landfall, right? Now, this can be asked either in your theory paper or when in the section where there is the map work section, we can ask you the to identify the type of town that is in. Now, if you see, there is an opening between there, right? That opening between that landform and that, so there's a gap, right? A simple gap. You don't even have to think of it. Uh, opening between two things, we refer to in everyday life, there's a gap, right? So, all we're going to do is now, we give it a geography name and we call it a gap. Town, right? See how easy that is? It is a gap town. Or otherwise, you could also refer to that as a gate town. Right, that is E. Now, let's look at F. F, they say to you, identify the factor that influence the shape of the settlement, right? So, 
What factor influence that shape? So now, if you look at over there, you will see that that is a road, right? And they will say to you, all right, but what is the reason for it? Okay, so you can analyze it and say, right, what is the reason? So because it looks like a T junction, so therefore the road has made that it developed all around it. In South Africa, all right, in the urban area, a lot of you most probably know about four ways in Johannesburg, a very, very well-known area, because that one, the road actually ran like this, and it's four ways. One, two, three, four. This one is like a T junction over there. Right. So then we're going to go to an I let this one up because I want to do this right at the end. Then we're going to go to look at this one over here. Right? So this, if you look at this, it's all along the road. So it is in a line. Right? It is in a line. So therefore, is it switching? Okay, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we seem to have a bit of a. I'm showing all kinds of arrows here and nothing is happening. Oh, okay. okay. Can you just two places? Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Technical hitch. <laughs> Okay, so shall we start again? All right, so quickly, uh, let's go to that one over there. All right, first one, um, a single unit, right? Um, no, wait, sorry, sorry. Let's go to A, right? We say to you, A is over there, right? A, what kind of settlement is that? Because it's away from water, because there's a big possibility, because there, if you look on your screen over there, you will see there is a river. Okay, so a river is over there. So that settlement that we're going to see over there is going to be in danger of flooding, right? So what kind of settlement are we going to refer to there? That's what I said to you. It's going to either be a dry point settlement or a wet point settlement. Right, then we're going to go that one over there, B, right? We're going to take B and we're going to compare it to C. Right, so look at B. B is only a single settlement or a house or a farm, whereas in this one over here, we see they are all grouped together. So that is a type of pattern, and that is a type of pattern. Right. Then we're going to look at this shape, right? The shape over there. So you can, on your um, drawing that you've got, or your notes that you've got, you can put there, that is what we refer to as the shape, right? And the shape over here, was determined by the road that came over there. Right, then we also said to you that over there, there's a mountain, there's a mountain, and there's an opening between the mountain. An opening is a gap, right? So we can call that a gap town or a gateway town. Then number G, over here is has to do with what is the shape of that, right? Now, this was pattern, pattern, that is shape and shape, type of town, right? And now these number A and number D is also 
this can also be a nucleated settlement, but the difference between this settlement is, is that this settlement is located near a dam. This settlement would not have been sitting over there or over there. It relies completely on the water. But, so, in other words, this one over here, where water is a problem, with water is a problem, it is called a dry point settlement. Yeah, where the settlement is dependent on the water, that is called my wet point settlement. Right, so let's go and see quickly the answers to each of these questions. Right, so number one, 411 is a dry point settlement. Wait, there we go. Okay, it's fine. And there we can see all the answers. Okay, have you got that? Okay. The questions and we'll give you the answers. Okay. All right. right, so let's do that quickly again. What is the name given to the settlement A, which is located away from the water? Because water is seen as a threat, right? That is referred to as the dry point settlement. Okay, then next question, 412, name the settlement pattern at B. Now remember, that was the little doiki on the top end there. And that is, now remember what I said to you just now, it can either be an isolated settlement or it can be a dispersed settlement. Then we go to uh, 413, why is a settlement C referred to as a nucleated settlement? And the nucleated settlement is because the buildings are grouped together and they are located close to one another. What evidence suggests that settlement D is a wet point settlement? Now remember I said to you that a wet point settlement is the settlement depends on the water. There we go. It is located next to the water source and what is my water source? It is the dam. Right. Then number E, give the name of the settlement and that is the settlement where I pointed out to you if you've got the two mountains on either side and there's an opening in between and, and that is a gap, right? But you could also, there are other possibilities that you can give, namely a gateway village, a nucleated, a compact, or any town that you know that you can classify as a gap town. Right, then 416, identify the factor that has influenced the shape of settlement F. And I said, we explained to you there we had, um, it is a T junction. And because the road made a T and everybody had to stop there, so therefore it led to a T junction shape. Then describe the shape of the settlement. Uh, at G and the shape of the settlement. Remember, there's a difference between shape and pattern, right? Shape and pattern. And there we have, it is a linear shape. Right, now, go on. I just wanted to show you, um, I think you might have this, yeah, in your notes, right? In your Teddy notes, um, just quickly, if you please scan round, go to your daily notes, and next to your round, you also write, it can either be round or square, okay? So, go to your daily notes, you can see there, it's either going to be round or square. When we go to our crossroads, the crossroads can also be T-shaped, right? So on the 
um, Telly notes, there you will see uh, it's exactly this drawing that I've got over here. Right. Now, our next thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at, are there any questions before we go on to rural settlement issues? Mrs. Pinchers, or anything? No, yeah. I don't see anything. No questions. Okay. okay. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to move to rural settlement issues. Very, very important today. Okay. You can see on the little diagram over here is this is what's happening. This is a lot of our problems today is because everybody wants from there to there. And that movement from there to there is, in many cases, not so good uh, because it's creating problems on this side and on that side. Okay, so let's have a look what, are, what will be our rural settlement issues. Okay, now I'm going to give this to you quickly to you so that you can all see this. Right. First of all, great talks is please make a very, very big note where you have got your um, settlement issues. Define rural urban migration in B. Very, 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 very important. What is the difference between rural urban migration and rural depopulation, okay? So, anybody wants to give me an answer? Vicente Crow? Right, nobody? Bishop Labour is asking. Mm -hmm. Bishop Labour is making. Bishop Labour, would you like to contribute? Oopsie. They're quiet today. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, right. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's see, first of all, right, so let's start off with the term rural urban migration, because that is the issue, rural urban migration. On this drawing over here, there you can see very nicely, rural, urban, okay? So why are people moving from this to that? Right, now, rural urban migration movement, and that is your definition. I know that my kids, when I still taught, um, they got very upset with me when they gave me the answer for rural depopulation, because there's a big difference between that definition and that definition over there. Right, so when we look at rural urban so rural means it's the movement of people from here from the rural areas to the urban areas Okay, all right, so there's a big difference between that. All right, so now we need to know, but why would people move from the rural area to the urban area? Right, now when we look at that, that movement from there is, um, and I always say this is also a very, very important thing that you need to understand, push and pull. Right. So 
when you get asked this at the end of the year, right? Be very, very careful when you answer your question that you don't get these two mixed up, right? So if they say to you, discuss the factors that will um, lead to rural depopulation, which means it's the push factors. In other words, why am I going to move away from the from this area? Right now, in my next slide, in my next slide that I've got, yeah, it shows you a very, very good way of why people will move from the rural areas. Okay. So from that, you will see the push factors is mechanization, there's low salaries, grant, there's crime, there's unemployment, and in other words, there is no source of income in that area. So with the result is that because of that, that is pushing people away to that area. So when we look at the pool factors, why will people go there, right? Because of better jobs, better salaries, better, better education, and are most probably going to get shot. Sometimes the education is debatable. Medical facilities, if you are sickly, and especially when you're old, right? Hospitals close in the flatland, so you need medical facilities, so you go over there. And then also at the end of the day is that people like the uh, lights. People want to go to movies. People want to go to nightclubs. And um, people want to enjoy life. And if you really saw uh, in the rural area, right? So if you saw in the rural areas over here, um, there's not much life for you. All right, there is TV and things like that and Netflix and... Um, but most of the times you actually want to be in the city as such. Right, so now this is what we refer to as rural urban migration. Right, now I'm going to go back to my previous slide and I'm going to see what is rural depopulation then. So rural urban migration is the movement of people from this to there, right? From the rural area to the urban area. So what is rural depopulation? Rural depopulation means that the number of people in this area is becoming less, right? Now, when this is becoming less, right, it has got a consequence. And what are the consequences? Right, here are the consequences, as you can see. Right, first of all, where do we start off? Because what is the backbone of your rural area? Nine out of ten times, it's farms, right? So what we have is that farms become, um, people leave the farms because they're not like any profitable anymore. Uh, crime on the farms, it's not safe over there, uh, and we've just seen now over the last couple of years with the terrible drought that we've had, if you looked on the news, how the farmers were trying to keep the people on the farm, uh, and if things uh, of like, for instance, natural disasters and things like that, drought, keep on going for it, it leads to unemployment, the farmer can't keep um, his workers. So at the end of the day, who's going to leave the farm first? Not the farmer. It's going to be the labourer that's going to. But then also, um, few investments. Now, and this is a terrible story over here. Okay, who stays behind over here? Not the young people. It's the old people, right? So the old people are the one who wants to move at the age of 65. Right? Definitely not me. Um, I'm settled and so are the people. They know their friends. So with the result is that this 
settlement, this rural settlement becomes older and older and older. Right. Also, another thing is very young men or very few young men say because who's the one that's going to leave first? The men, right? So you have lots of young females, but not many young men in it. The next thing that happens is that uh, because people don't want to go and stay there, right? The low property value, and you can get a beautiful house. Uh, for half the price that what you but possibly would pay in any of the Cape Town areas. Next one is the year begins the cycle. Shop starts to close, right? Once one shop starts to close, the next one starts to close. That leads to unemployment again. And so all with all of this, it is leading to all kinds of issues because they are not shops. Suddenly, where you used to have a primary school, a high school, the high school closes down. So now the teachers that uh, were there, they've got to find another job or go to another school. And then also the other thing is services below standard. Because there's not many uh, people, so therefore you find that not many um, people will worry. And that is one of the big things service providing. So because there are not many people, you tend to find that the municipality doesn't have the money. And um, so the roads become dilapidated, the water is not always so good. So all kinds of issues develop there. Right. Okay. Any questions on that? Right, so, and then the last thing is, what have we done? And this is, uh, the important thing is to advertise our rural areas by recreation tourists, and this is the end thing, restore your buildings, and you have your special school, like, for instance, yeah, in, close to us, um, in the Platteland area where uh, parents like to send their children to to the Platteland schools or to the rural schools because there they can um, they can actually feel that there is less influence of our modern society, drugs and all those kind of things. That's not necessary. <laughs> but people have got that perception. Right. And also uh, there is cheap sites, lands are much cheaper, so for that leads again to a new thing, mm -hmm. which is decentralization. Okay. Right, so there we have the one uh, issue um, is rural urban migration. So we've got that rural uh, urban migration and we have got the um, rural depopulation. Then our next segment, so I just wanted to show you quickly here yeah, what looks, uh, what happens when we have this, um, the rural area become run down. You can see old deserted farmhouses, buildings are become dilapidated, shops starts to close, and then you see how to improve it. Then you have all these kind of businesses start to develop. So to keep the people, you will have these hiking trails, you will have these um, places where people can come, they can come and visit and so forth. Okay, and then the last one is, right, so I'm going to go quickly and just define the term uh, rural depopulation. I'm not going to give that to you because I've done that, but uh, which age group is first to migrate to cities? Now, if you look at the group of people that are most likely to move, and like I said to you, is that um, the people that will move are mainly men. So you can write in there the answer there is anything between 18 and 35, and then um, state one characteristic of a ghost town, and you can see the is in the notes that I've given you on um, what the town actually looks like. Right. Here we've got it. 
Okay. We will send these, um, I'll send the PowerPoint to Mrs. Prisler and she will then send this to you so that you can just follow in these answers. Okay. Right. So two reasons why stagnation, no growth occurs. Um, because it's all of those things that I've given you there. So, um, and that is quite important that we look at how do we rejuvenation of the rural area. Okay, and then same thing with the paragraph, solution to attract people to the rural area, um, central de uh, industrial decentralization and um, there we can implementation of the gear, uh, RDP, uh, improving farming and basic needs, establishment of parks and recreational facilities, festivals um, become very, very popular, attract communities. Um, like for instance, you have your Route 24 where people go and you go and you go there for your markets or like for instance, the Olive Festival. So um, the South African government is doing a lot to make the rural attractive for people to go to again. Right, and then our last um, issue is land reform. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, first thing that I can say to you, this is very important, is make sure that you know the definition of each of these following terms, right? Number one, land reform. What is the definition of land reform? It is the injustice of apartheid where people were forcibly removed from the land of address. Okay, now I'm sure all of you can read, so I'm really intrigued that you have to go and sit here and read each of But I want to point out that each one of these um, terms or concepts you need to know. Right? So when we go and they ask you, say, what are the challenges? Is then this is what we have to mention um, to overcome land restitution, land redistribution, and land tenure um, reform. Okay, so great twelve. Very, very, very important. Okay. Now, before I start with urban settlement, uh, that gives me the next hour, so you can stand up quickly. Um, and then um, we can quickly finish the rest. Okay, if you just wonder. We've got half an hour left. Oh, I think I hit it. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. We're going to carry on. Okay. Now we're going to again urban settlement. Um, when we look at, and I, I showed you, when I showed you at the beginning, we spoke about settlements. We said a rural settlement, urban settlement. Right. When we look at a, a rural settlement, we've done now in great detail. When we're going to go and our urban settlement, we're going to look at different things on the um, urban settlement, multifunctional, we spoke about a secondary and tertiary activities, and we spoke about the quaternary function, now exactly the same as factors that influence site uh, and situation. Now, if you look back again, I said to you when we did um, the site, where did Cape Town st start from? So you will see there is a huge overlap uh, between our settlement factors for um, rural settlement and urban because the one led to the other one. All right, so factors influencing there um, plays an important role there. All right, so just let's look at Cape Town quickly. So there we can see settlement for flatland, definitely not on the sea. A harbour promoted it. 
And now if we look at the, we can see the buildings and so forth. So these are the factors that contributed to the development of Cape Town uh, that it's grown. Wasn't like this. It originally started as a little castle over here and everything grew from there. Okay, right. So when we look at the town, when we look at the uh, this town, now Cape Town had a specific function. Now in this, you will see that we have got different functions. So Cape Town has got a specific function. And so when you look at the three main reasons for um, for why a town is there, we're going to see there is central places. In other words, it is the central place. Okay, people are going to go there for lower order functions, and they're going to go there for higher order functions. So what is lower order function and higher order? Lower is what I need every day. Okay, higher order is uh, for your health and also for specialists and education. Then we're going to go to transport, break of bulk, okay, junction, and your gap towns. Again, grade 12, it's important that you know the definitions. And then the last one over here are specialized towns. And now we look at, for example, if you take uh, Kimberley, yeah, we've got Dalcom. Kimberley is a mining town. Stellenbosch, educational. Sasselberg, industrial. Langebein, resort. I'm just giving you uh, different examples to what we've got over here, commuter Soweto. Um, so each of these towns like, developed a specific function. Right? Now, there we go to our central place town, and it's got a central place means everybody goes there. Right? Then we're going to go to trade and transport. Um, there is trade and transport, so you're going to sell stuff, you're going to transport this stuff, and the type of trade and transport will develop on, or de yeah, will develop from how it gets to the place, junction, cap town, specialized cities, right. Now, when we look at our settlement, when we look at our settlements, our settlements are not all the same size. And now that is where we started, right? And we are now in this top half of our um, of our settlement. So we're going there from a small village, right? Hamlet, large town, or small town, large town, city, and each of these different cities or different segments have got different functions, right? We have low order functions, we have got high order functions, and depending on that, right, um, depending on that function, if that will determine how many people will actually visit that town, right? So let's have a look there. What is a uh, lower and high order function? A uh, low order function, again, uh, is that you need to buy often. A high order is not as often as it, and this is your bread and stuff like that. And we go, again, what is a function? Definition, right? What is the definition of a threshold population? What is the definition of a range? What is the definition of a sphere of influence? Uh, distance that I have to travel, number of shops, and so forth. Right, so this grade 12, we can also apply to our map work. Um, so it's important that you know the definition for that. All right, so let's go to the quickly. Um, the, in your notes, you will have that all those definitions, please, very, very important, are the um, definitions for these um, different things, for these different concepts. And then 
we're going to look at your urban structure and pattern. Now, when we look at your urban structure and pattern, you will see that this is, again, if we go back to Cape Town, right at the beginning when we set you a settlement, right? A settlement is communication. Communication and transport. If you go and you look at all your towns, whether it is a small town or a big town, it will have different street patterns. Again, in your notes, you will have is you will have advantages and disadvantages, and that is important that you um, get to know that. And that is really, really, I can't stress that enough um, because this comes up also in your map work. Right, and then now, what does it actually look like on a real map? It's all good, fine, and well to show you to you, all right, this is what it looks like, but this is where it comes to. So when we give you a map with paper, right, so where do we look? Right, so there we can see exactly how you will identify that on the uh, map, when you do the map work section. And there you go as well. Right. So now the theory you can apply to the practical section of your map work. All right. So then we've got a linear shape pole. Most of you must probably be to pole, and you know that it's got one of the longest um, main streets in this area. Okay. Right. Now, when we look at the city, we go back to Cape Town. Right. Cape Town. If we go to Cape Town, we will see we can identify different areas. And that area is called land use zones, right? The first one is the CBD. Then we've got the industrial area. Then we've got residential area. We've got commercial area. We've got zone of decay, decay and rural urban fringe. Okay. So what does it look like? So first of all, Let's have a look at this drawing here quickly. And this is very, very important because indirectly, this also affects your question that can come up in climatology. And in climatology, they will say to you, but why is the temperature much higher here than over here, right? And this is, that is the link between your settlement geography with your climatology. So now that we're doing settlement geography, you most probably will understand this a lot better when you do the question on your climatology. So let's look at our first area. So CBD, right? The CBD is the area in the middle where you've got your very tall buildings, right? Then we've got an area where it's like in between, which is your transition zone. Then you have an area where people need to live. And then you have an area where you people are going to make your bread and everything. So which is your industrial area. And then right on the edge, we have got, which is like a farming area, which is the rural area. So when we look at these um, areas, so different thing. And that brings us again to why is this so expensive? Because everybody wants to be there. Everybody's competing for it. So what do we do? We're not going horizontal, but we're going vertical, right? What is this area, my transition zone? And my transition zone is that area that in between, we don't know whether it is a CBD or whether we don't know whether it is a residential area. And then obviously the industries are put on the outside, because it is one of the biggest things is because of the pollution. Right, now what I'm going to do here quickly is I'm just going to run through the zones so that you can see for yourself what is it actually really looks like. Right, there you've got your CBD. And like I always say to my learners is you could always identify a CBD because it's got the highest buildings in that area. Right. Can I just interject? Yeah. 
um, good afternoon. Oh, good morning. CBD. Does anybody yeah. know what CBD stands for? The acronym? Is there anybody who wants to tell us, tell us in the chat what the acronym CBD stands for? Okay, right. So again, there is the CBD. So again, I, I am a firm believer if I see it, I will remember it. Okay, so there we go to the CBD. Okay, CBD, CBD, sorry, um, CBD stands for Central Business District, right? CBD stands for Central Business District, and believe it or not, Break talk, they actually ask you what CBD stands for, and I've had some weird and wonderful answers to that. Right, so then our next area that we're going to get is our industries. Again, uh, this is very applicable to your map work. Um, you're going to have your light and your heavy industries, and they are um, very noticeable. Then we have a new thing which is sort of like in between your commercial areas. Um, and we've used examples here of Cape Town so that you are all familiar with our commercial areas. They are in that in-between area, they're in that transition zone area, um, and they've made the transition zone more valuable and people have become more willing to go to that area because it's pleasant and it's not um, it's crime-free and you can spend the whole day there. Right. Then our next one is our residential area. Now, from this, you can see very, very clearly the different types of uh, residential areas that we have. We have high income, we have both low income, and we've got informal settlement. Now, a high income grade course is not a problem, right? The difference is when it comes to this one, the low income and the informal segment. And I want you people to please, because I want you to please look at the difference in when we talk about an informal segment and a low income segment housing, right? A low income, you can see it is houses that have been built on a particular area, and there is a, some kind of pattern. There's electricity. There's water, but when we look at an informal settlement, an informal settlement and a squatter camp is completely different, right? And you will see the question that we've uh, given is related to this. If you're staying in the high income, you don't have a problem, okay? You can build that house anywhere, but it's an informal settlement that is where all the problems, because that is where fire will take place, that is where flooding will take place, because if we look at this particular area, can you see any electricity in this area, right? This looks like a fairly uh, flat area, but if we had to take any part in Cape Town, we will see that flooding is a regular uh, phenomenon in this area. And Cape Town Municipality needs to have a plan B when there is rain on its way because these people need to be relocated because look at the buildings that they stay in. It is not a permanent structure. Okay, so let's go to our next one. So there is again, is just a middle and high income. Um, what are these buildings? I and mean, this is very important. Okay, and I always say to my learners is that the informal segment, Basically, anything that you can build a house with is acceptable. The problem is that this is not a sturdy house. So if the wind is strong, it will blow it away. If it's flooding, it will wash away. So yes, I can go and build a thing, but it is not a long time segment. Okay, then we go to quickly our transition zone. All right, it's that zone that I spoke to you. Now in this transition zone, in some cases, it become run down. In other cases, like for instance, in Cape Town, we've had Century City, so it's been built up. Okay, um, there is the new thing, right? Exactly. Renovation, renewal, reducing housing. And so it's making 
you can either have a place looking like that, or you can have an area like Century City there. And you can see what is being done there. And which that is an example. Yeah, as a okay. That area over there yeah. can be Woodstock. Mm. That is um, so Woodstock. yeah, mm. Woodstock area over there. Um, but also very, very you go in Woodstock, and I love going there on a Saturday morning because you have certain areas have been this whole mm. renewal where you can go and get um, nice chairs and things like that. So it's a combination um, of activities in this area. And there's also a lot of these houses that they've done up and they've made it pretty and people are young professional people are staying in that area. And the reason for it is because they don't have to travel so far into town. Okay, right, so next thing we're going to do is then we see our commercial areas, zone of decay, okay, and then your urban profile. So, again, okay, right, we're just going to go through there again. Right, so, okay. All right, so when we look at this, and before we start with, I want to focus on the rural urban fringe. Now, the rural urban fringe is one part that comes up in your um, map work quite often. Is why are these places found in the areas? All right, so if we look at your race course, the recreation, your golf course, also the other one is the um, the airport, cemetery, why are they on the outside of it? So please, Great Force, take note of the rural urban front. What are the factors or what are the um, functions that are found in this area? But also very, very, very important is why are they there? Okay, why are these things on the Like for instance, the airport, noise, safety, and so forth. I'm not going to go into much of that. Right. Then they have got that for you. Right. So if you're going to go in the following things that we're going to go there is the land use zone. Um, all these different questions. Um, again, I have got the answers. I will give it to you. We'll send it through to you. But one of the big things that we need to look at is the following. Right. The problems with, with, with urban settlement is urbanization, the level of urbanization, urban growth, urban expansion, and the rate of urban. And each of these things are creating issues, urban issues. Okay? Right, so urban settlement issues Okay, there we go. So let's have a look at the one that we first um, is congestion, right? Now, I'm sure most of you uh, will know that you've got to get onto a bus uh, in the mornings and for some of the parents that need to drive into town or where is, um, because we are staying further and further away from, the, from our work. So we have to get into our car. Um, we have got, we have to travel long distances to get so, which means um, that we are all in our cars. And it's quite interesting that we can see interesting things. I when I go into town, and I see how many single people when they're sitting in a car. So too many cars on the road. Okay, the other thing is, our uh, next problem is urban decay. But uh, as our cities are growing bigger and bigger, space is becoming a, a problem, right? So in other words, we are now going into the old areas, old residential areas. And because the properties are very valuable, not the building, the property is valued, many of the own owners will actually leave the buildings to become dilapidated so it becomes an area where all kinds of funny things happen. 
Now, with the urban um, areas growing, one of the big problems is our um, overcrowding. Okay. Overcrowding. And um, there we go with our urban problems. And there, grade 12, we can see uh, again, I will have. Can I just say something at the end? Yeah. Okay. okay so, all of these things I have got on PowerPoint, and I will give it to um, to Mrs. Princhner, and she can forward all of it to you, um, so that you will have a good summary of everything that you should know in settlement geography. Okay. And to what the questions that they were given. Yeah. And most of all important is work through the questions and then um, you can go to your teacher and your teacher will then give you the answer. Don't just expect the teacher to give it to you. Work it out and then you can go and check with it. Okay, and then tomorrow we will do economic geography. Have a lovely day.